Welcome back to another Disciple Dojo Study Bible Review. If you're new to this channel, what we do is try to offer more in-depth reviews of various study Bibles on the market that go a little bit further than the cover design, the page thickness, the typeface, those more aesthetic details. And we try to dig into what are you going to find theologically? What is the viewpoint that the study Bible is going to come from? And before we get into that, if you haven't already subscribed, we would really appreciate you doing just that. We're trying to hit 5,000 subscribers by the end of this year. And another way that you can support Disciple Dojo is check out our online store. We have a number of t-shirts. We've got gifts. We've got stuff related to jujitsu, stuff related to Bible study, because if you know me and you've been around this channel, you know, that's kind of what I nerd out on. And any of the designs, like for instance, this Mica 68 t-shirt design I'm wearing, they're also available on any of the styles and any of the products over in the store. So if you like this design, but you'd rather have it on a hoodie because the weather's getting nice and cool, you don't particularly love this color, you want to add a special message on the back, you can do that too with the customize it tool. Check it out. And again, anything purchased there really helps support this ministry. Okay, we got that out of the way. Let's jump into the starting place study Bible review. The starting place study Bible is 1,773 pages. There are 14 full color glossy maps in the back comes in this dust jacket and when you take that off it looks like this and it is a double columned bible in terms of color the pages are all duo tone they're this navy and yellow gold color so if you are a georgia tech fan or a michigan fan or an indiana pacers fan this is the bible that you'll resonate with color wise it is not a red letter edition nor is it a full color edition. Everything in these shades of blue and gold. Now throughout there are, as you can see here, illustrations and maps, both photographs and drawn illustrations. The paper is not that tissue thin, but it's also not thick. So you do get bleed through when you're looking, you're gonna see what's on the page behind it. And there are slight margins, but not very much. It's gonna be a little hard to take any in-depth notes in this study Bible. There are no cross references. There are just study notes at the bottom and then different little essays or call out boxes. The introduction at the beginning tells you where all of the study material in the starting place study Bible comes from. It comes from a number of different Zondervan sources and it lists them right here. You've got book introductions and these are all adapted from the Essential Bible Companion as well as the NIV Quest Study Bible. Then you have the study notes at the bottom of each page those are all adapted from the NIV Foundation Study Bible. Then you have these context notes and essays. Those are pulled from the NIV Archaeological Study Bible. And then these Q&A boxes sprinkled throughout. Those come from the NIV Quest Study Bible. The character biographies come from the NIV Student Bible. And then these yellow boxes called Bible Truths, those come from the NIV Rock Solid Faith Study Bible. Between the Old and the New Testament, there's a one-page overview called From Malachi to Christ, which is a timeline of the intertestamental events. And then in the back, after Revelation, you have your table of weights and measures. Then you have a number of reading plans. And in addition to the one-year reading plan, they have other reading plans like a 60-day overview of the Bible, 20 not-so-famous Bible stories, 30 days of great faith, and 30 30 days with Jesus. Then after that, you have the subject index. This covers all of the subjects that are addressed in the supplemental material, the study notes and the essays. Then right after that, you have a combination dictionary concordance. And that's it. There aren't any other special features to this study Bible. It's pretty basic and straightforward. Keep in mind, this Bible is culled together from a number of different resources. So the questions come from one resource, the book intros come from another resource. The study notes come from another resource, the archaeological stuff. So it's cobbling together a number of different Zondervan resources by numerous contributors. But as a result, you feel a little bit of that kind of mishmash approach. So for instance, the book intro to Genesis is very good. It focuses mostly on the literary aspects, but you see a number of different approaches kind of pop up without really much reconciliation between them. So for example, what I mean on page six in the Bible truths box on God created the world, it says, 
These early chapters of Genesis aren't necessarily about the how of creation, they teach you about the who. So that's a pretty non-concordist approach that's fairly common in Genesis interpretation. But then some of the study notes reflect a semi-concordist and some a full concordist approach. So in other words, the note for chapter 1 verse 7 is pretty phenomenological. It talks about the separation of the waters and that it's possible that this is simply a reference to what we would call the water cycle. And that would fit with more of kind of an old earth approach. But then when you get to chapter 7 verse Verse 11, the note there says that up until this chapter, no rain had fallen on the earth. Well, those two notes somewhat contradict each other. If 1 7 is to be read phenomenologically, then part of that water in the air and water on the ground and the separation between the two is the water cycle, the precipitation, condensation, all those things that we learn about in elementary school. So there's a little bit of a tension even in the notes in Genesis itself. But then there's also a number of study notes that compare the rhetoric of Genesis with other ancient Near East accounts and talk about how Genesis functions as something of a polemic against the other views throughout the ancient Near East, which if you followed Disciple Dojo this summer, that's pretty much all we've been looking at. So that was nice to see included. And most of those come from the archaeological study Bible, which is the study Bible we've reviewed here on the channel that I personally use in my own teaching and preaching. Then in Genesis 5, when it talks about the long lifespans of people, it gives a somewhat young earth creationist approach. It says one suggestion is that these ages were possible because of tremendously different climate and environmental conditions that were in effect before the flood. But it does note that this is speculation, which it is. There's nothing in the text that talks about climate changes before or after the flood. When you come to Genesis 6 and the enigmatic sons of God and daughters of man, the note here does a good job in not taking a particular view, but of the three main views, it only lists two of them, which is disappointing. Another area of tension in the notes is when you come to how they handle the flood account. The Q&A box up at the top of page 14 ends by saying, some believe this flood was worldwide, others think it covered a region of the world, but is described in universal language, much as we might speak of a world war without meaning that every nation in the world was involved. But then the study note at the the bottom of that page for verse 19 says this explicit declaration accompanied by the assertion in verse 21 that every living thing died makes it clear that this was no localized event but in actuality a worldwide catastrophic flood. So the study note is more dogmatic than the Q&A box on the very same page. When we come to Exodus, there's a brief introduction. All the book introductions are very brief. I don't think any are more than two and a half pages. And this takes the view that the Exodus happened on the early dating, not the later dating. In fact, I couldn't really even find much mention of the two different dates for the Exodus that evangelical scholars have typically held to. It just gives the early date and then the notes identify the pharaohs of the early chapters of Exodus according to that date, which is odd since the 13th century date and the 15th century date are both held by numerous evangelical scholars. It's split kind of down the middle at least. So to not present both of those or really acknowledge them is a little odd. One thing that was nice to see is the Q&A box on page 85 did note how the plagues were aimed at the specific gods or the area that the gods oversaw in Egypt, even identifying by name a number of the Egyptian gods who were targeted by the plagues. And then along with the note at chapter 10 verse 1, there are two Q&A boxes on page 88 and 89, both dealing with the question of Pharaoh's hardened heart. Now we've dealt with that extensively here, both in a teaching video and in a superhero seminary lecture. So it was nice to see more space given to that, what's really a disturbing question in a lot of people's minds and has serious theological ramifications depending on how you choose to answer it. But another area where then they overlooked a view widely held among evangelical scholars was when they talked about the number of people involved in the Exodus. They take the approach, the number of men would indicate a total population of perhaps 3 million men, women, and children. That's on the high end of even the most conservative estimates. But more importantly, they don't give any mention of the fact that the word translated as thousands, elif, can also be translated as something like clans or regiments or, or even families. And so there's significant difference 
in how scholars handle those numbers in the Exodus account. When you have faithful Bible-believing scholars who take the position that there were tens of thousands, and then you have others who say, no, it was closer to this, in the millions. It's not unimportant, especially when you're looking at things like archaeology and sociological impact that a migrating group of people would have had in the ancient world and the numbers of other known population centers at the time. And those are questions that skeptics are right to key in on when criticizing the biblical account. So for a study Bible aimed at people starting out studying the Bible, I feel like they should have given the different perspectives that biblical interpreters have held rather than just going with the high end of the traditional view only. Now, another thing we've spent a lot of time this year discussing here at Disciple Dojo is the Exodus event, the location of Mount Sinai and all of the symbolism involved in the tabernacle. Well, we have a mixed bag when it comes to the starting place study Bible. It does note two possible routes. Unfortunately, of the two routes, neither are what I think is the most probable. So the fact that they don't even include the Arabian route is not surprising, but it is disappointing. If you don't know what any of that means, check out our series here we did this summer on Mount Sinai. I'll include a link below in the description for that. And you can make up your own mind what you think is the most probable. But when we come to those later chapters of Exodus, where it's talking about the tabernacle and the priestly implements and all of the stuff that's going to go into making it, they did a really good job on page 109 and 110 of illustrating this whole structure and the various implements that God is commanding the Israelites to build. When we come to Romans, the introduction was surprisingly short. It's not even a full page, which given how important Romans is among typical evangelical readership, I was just expecting a little more. It's not that there's anything wrong with the introduction, and, and it, all of the book introductions, they're good. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just pretty sparse. But when we come to Romans 7, there's no discussion of the I of Romans 7. Who is this person who's speaking? Who is this I who can't do what he wants to do and only does what he doesn't want to do and is a wretched man who will deliver me? That whole debate among interpreters of Romans that's raged for the entire history of the interpretation of Romans, there's no mention at all of that in the notes. When you get to chapters 8 and 9 and questions about predestination start coming up, the notes don't give really anything, but there is a Q&A box on page 1480, and it notes both the traditional Calvinist view, the traditional Arminian view, and it even, surprisingly, notes the corporate view, which that was really nice to see because that view frequently gets left out of discussions of how to handle these chapters in Romans. And cards on the table, I also think it's the most faithful view of the three. If you want to see why, check out the video here on the channel where we discuss Calvinism. I'll put a link below in the description. But then the note in Romans 11, where it talks about all Israel will be saved, is pretty ambiguous. It doesn't give any indication that there's even a, really a debate about who is this all Israel that will be saved. Is it all ethnic Jews? Is it a majority of ethnic Jews, but not necessarily everyone? Or is it everyone, Jew and Gentile, who is grafted into the one tree who together represent all Israel, in quotes. The note just says, all Israel does not mean every individual Israel in the nation will turn to the Lord. It means that the nation as a whole will be saved just as the nation as a whole, but not every individual in it is now rejecting the Lord. So once more, you're getting one view, but no discussion that there are any other views on what is a pretty important passage when it comes to understanding everything from eschatology to modern day politics to how we interact with our Jewish friends and family, all of which would be very helpful for somebody who's just starting out in studying the Bible to at least have on their radar. And finally, we come to Revelation. Unlike Romans, Revelation has one of the more substantial book introductions of all of the books I looked at. It's three pages long. It does a good job explaining the genre of Revelation and the different pitfalls that people can get into when they try to read it in a literalistic way because it is 
symbolic apocalyptic language. And it even lays out the four different interpretive views that Revelation interpreters have taken over the centuries without coming down on any one in particular. And then the notes in the opening chapters to the seven churches, they're not bad, but they're just, once again, really, really sparse. For example, let's look at the one we always like to look at in these reviews, the background note on the church at Laodicea. It says, Laodicea was 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia and 90 miles east of Ephesus. It was a wealthy city with thriving banks, a textile industry, and a medical school. The city was also known for its sparse water supply. Apply. All these characteristics are played upon in Christ's message to the church. And that's absolutely true. It just doesn't tell you how they're played upon. It doesn't go into the fact that Laodicea did not have hot water or cold water. It only had lukewarm water and how it had to get its hot water from one place, its cold water from another, and the problems that that would cause for the people drinking it. In other words, what it gives isn't wrong. It's just like barely an appetizer, especially when it comes to historical background that the average beginning Bible study student is just not going to know. And like they did with the all Israel in Romans 11, the note on the 144,000 in Revelation 7 is very ambiguous. It just says those sealed are all the children of Israel, fulfilling the promise that when the full number of Gentiles has come in, all Israel will be saved. But it doesn't unpack at all, one, the different views on who the 144,000 are, and two, the symbolism of using 144,000 from the tribes of Israel at this moment in the vision, especially in light of what's going to happen in the very next verse when John actually looks and sees this multitude census that has been taken. And you can't fit all of this in any study Bible or else it would be, you know, 10 times thicker. But at least on things of this level of significance, it would be helpful for a good study Bible for beginning Bible study students to once again, at least let them know hey, this is an area where different interpreters read this passage very differently, which they absolutely do a great job of doing on the chapter involving the millennium. When you get to Revelation 20, there's a whole Q&A box about the millennium that explains the three different views of the millennium. And that was nice to see because that is a huge issue in terms of forming one's eschatology. Now, one more thing I wanted to look at is how the study notes handled issues involving complementarianism, egalitarianism. That's something that many readers want to know when they come to a study Bible. What am I going to find when I open this study Bible regarding women and ministry? And no surprise, the starting place study Bible is a mixed bag. So for example, some of the notes seem to lean pretty complementarian. Genesis 3.16, for instance, it says the word desire can also mean an attempt to usurp authority or control as in 4.7. Now that is very much an interpretation contextually of what they are saying the desire in 4.7 is implying, but but that's an interpretive argument. It's far beyond just a lexical grammatical point. But nevertheless, that's one that you will hear among more complementarian readers and interpreters sometimes. And they go on to say the last two lines of this verse could be paraphrased. You will now have a tendency to try to dominate your husband and he will have the tendency to act as a tyrant. Each strives for control and neither lives in the best interest of the other. The antidote is in the restoration of mutual respect and dignity through Christ Jesus. Now that is one way that this passage gets read, especially within complementarian circles, but by no means is it the only way this passage gets read. And in fact, I would argue that given how the word desire is used, not just in Genesis 4-7, but then later in the Song of Solomon, which is the only other place that the word is found besides Genesis, it speaks of the desire of the husband being restored to the wife. It doesn't have any of the connotations of usurping authority or wanting to rule over any of that. Now, another place where there's a slight tension, not, not too much, but a little bit, at least that's how it struck me when I read it, was in dealing with Ephesians chapter 5 and the wives submit to your husband passage. The study note at 522 through 24 talks about how in marriage relationships, a husband and a wife have different roles, which is a standard complementarian view. But then the Q&A box on that same page when it talks about wives submitting to the husbands, it talks about mutual submission between husbands and wives, 
which is what most egalitarians would key in on, and most complementarians probably wouldn't. And then there's some more places where the starting place study Bible sounds a little more egalitarian than complementarian. For instance, Romans 16, the Q&A box on page 1488, when it's talking about the roles that women had in the early church, it does say other women probably had significant ministry roles in the church, including leadership, teaching, and evangelism. Many believe Junia, a feminine name, may refer to a woman who, along with her husband, was an apostle of the church serving as a church messenger or missionary. And of course, Junia is a very important character to egalitarians, and her role tends to be downplayed by complementarians. And then the notes on other passages in the debate are somewhat ambiguous, kind of a neutral approach. 1 Timothy 2.11, which is sort of the big boy in terms of complementarian passages, the note says these verses are not easy to understand and there are many differences of opinion as to their meaning. The scripture here does actually say just what it looks like, that women must be silent and submissive. Now, that's not entirely true because there are some translation issues involved in how this passage is actually rendered. So even on that, it's not quite as straightforward as the notes would imply. They go on to say, it is universally accepted that this is referring to times of public worship, although the Bible makes it clear that a woman must submit to her husband, but the concept of submission also applies to all believers. Philippians 4, 5 says, let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Being submissive means not being unruly or argumentative. There are times when it is proper for a woman to teach, pray, or prophesy, but in this instance, it was not supposed to happen in public worship. So they're taking somewhat of a mediating approach, or at least a more neutral approach, and you also see this in the Q&A box on that same page. They begin, no answer to this question is viewed as correct by everyone. In fact, the responses of Christians to this question tend to fall into four major groupings, and then they give the different ways Christians have approached 1 Timothy chapter 2. To their credit, They say, while each position has solid biblical support, there are also clear exceptions that keep debates on the topic ongoing. And somewhat related, one thing that I did think was encouraging to see was the note on 1 Timothy 2.9 about women dressing modestly. The note explains that in context, this is not about not flaunting one's body as much as its directions about not flaunting one's wealth or status. You know, this it just gets assumed that Paul's talking about not wearing revealing clothing, tight pants, a low-cut blouse, or something like that. But actually, that wasn't even an issue in the early church. The issue was people coming in, flaunting their wealth, their status, wearing their nicest clothes, ornate hairstyles, all of the things that marked social status in the ancient world. So the equivalent today in modern churches wouldn't be somebody walking into a church service in yoga pants as much as it would be somebody walking into a church service in a $6,000 suit and a $10,000 watch. And we could do a whole video just on that verse, and maybe we will. Leave it in the comments below if you'd like to see that. So in terms of the whole complementary and egalitarianism, you're going to find kind of a little bit of both. It's broad enough that either view could make use of this Bible. So let's talk pros and cons of the Starting Place Study Bible. I like the fact that on some issues where there is debate among Christians, it doesn't take a dogmatic stance. If you've watched any of my Bible reviews, you know I think a good study Bible should should tell you when there are differences of opinions among Christian interpreters, and it should do its best to give you the options. I was a little disappointed that it didn't do that with some issues that I think are worth that treatment, but the issues where it did note division, it did a good job being fair to the different positions. I do like that. I think the layout on the page, visually, Uh, graphically, in terms of ease of use, finding what you need. I think that's all done very well. The typeface is nice. The notes are clearly distinguished from the text. Visually, it works well at conveying information. And I think it's a good idea culling from different Zondervan resources into one study Bible It's kind of like a a buffet sampler of the strengths of the different works out there. The Archaeological Study Bible, the Quest Study Bible, the Bible Companion, and all of the other ones that they pulled from. That's 
I like that idea. That's a good idea. If I had to kind of rank this among its peers, I would say this is better than the Quest Study Bible. So if you were deciding between the Quest Study Bible and the Starting Place Study Bible, I would say you're going to get more for your money with this one. But I think that it falls short of something like the Life Application Study Bible or even the NLT Study Bible. I think you get more of what you're looking for in one of those than you do in this. So that's where I would put it, kind of in between, you know, Quest, this, and then maybe like Life Application, NLT Illustrated, something like that. Even just the NIV Study Bible, I think, is probably a little better than this. And I say that because of the cons. Uh, the cons are, it's kind of a camel. And what I mean by that, that's an allusion for those of you who aren't in this level of nerdiness. That's an allusion to the show Parks and Recreation, where the episode called The Camel, they all came together to try to, I think they had to design a mural or something. And so you had all of this input and they just tried to like combine everybody's ideas into one idea. And the result was this kind of mutated uh just bizarre looking thing and they called it the camel meaning that a camel is a funny looking creature because it's like all these different body parts of different animals that were just kind of stuck together and that's what a camel is well that's how this struck me it's it's all these good parts of these good resources that may work on their own but when you kind of bring them all together into one resource i, I don't know if it works completely the tension in the study notes, as we looked at here, sometimes even on the same page, that was a little jarring. The level of the notes, some of the notes were very, very, very basic. And then some of them were pretty advanced when it starts talking about ancient Near East polemics. So it's kind of operating at different levels. When I was reading this and prepping for this review, I was thinking, who would be the ideal audience for this? Because it seemed to just keep changing. Some of the articles and notes were pretty advanced and good for rigorous theological students of the Bible. And then others were really basic, like overly simplified. Even though study Bible for beginners, I think there's some depth you can get to that I'm not convinced the starting place study Bible really does a great job of. So would I recommend this as a study Bible? It's not bad. It's not terrible. Um, I just think there are some out there that do a better job at the things that this is trying to do. I'd give this a C plus, maybe a B minus. Um, it, it wouldn't be my first choice, but if you use it and you like it, great. Yeah, I guess that just sums up my feelings on it. Just, eh. So those are my completely subjective thoughts. I would love to hear yours. If you've used this study Bible, leave your thoughts in the comments below. As always, if there are study Bibles you would like to see reviewed here at Disciple Dojo, feel free to send them to me. I'll be happy to look at them. A viewer sent me this and asked for my honest opinion on it. And so that's what this video is. If you've got one you'd like me to review, get in touch with me over on the Disciple Dojo website at our contact page. And if it's one I think would make for a good review here on the channel, I'll be happy to take a look at it. All right, that's all for this review. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo. Mm -hmm.